Sorry, guys. All right, welcome, Vanessa, Ralcia, and Catherine. They're our presenters for the last video series, and we appreciate so much that you folks went to a two-day workshop and are now going to um, present some information to us. So without further ado, Vanessa, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, we can get started. Can you guys see it? Yes, thank you. There it is. Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to talk today about the pyramid approach, building functional and creative learning settings. Okay. The pyramid approach to education is a great resource for teachers and parents that desire to apply an effective intervention plan to achieve goals for individuals with autism. You will find uh, during the presentation, the signs of the behavior, functional objectives, functional teaching, functional communication, text, and many other effective tools and instructions that are going to amplify your knowledge about the complex world of teaching and learning under the umbrella. Who is behind the pyramid approach? The main person is Andy Bundy. He is the president and co-founder of the Pyramid uh, Educational Consultant. Dr. Bundy is an innovative leader in the field of autism and applied behavior analysis. He, he directed a statewide public school system for students with autism for 14 uh, years. He is the co-author of the PECS training manual, and he wrote the pyramid approach to education. And this is the information that Sandy is going to be emailing, uh, emailing everybody. Um, he has a PhD and a, a master's, and he graduated from the University of Kent. And she's a senior consultant in PECS, the supervisor for pyramid educational consultants in the United States. She has um, about 30 years experience in, in all these campus, uh, including the developmental uh, disabilities. She specializes in providing training and consultation to um, uh, the people who serve individuals with complex communication uh, needs. In addition to communication training and consultations, she provides training and consultation on developing effective educational environments with a focus on improving learners' skill set and decreasing unwanted behaviors. She has worked uh, all over the United States and internationally as well. So let's start with applied behavior analysis. It's the process of systematically applying interventions based upon principles of learning theory. Two, improve socially significant behaviors to a meaningful degree and to demonstrate that the interventions employed are responsible for the improvement in the behavior. What is applied behavior analysis? It's not something that we do to the students. It's a description of how the world works. It is the science of how the world affects the person, how the person affects the world, how the person affects other people, and how the person's behavior affects other parts of the same person's behavior. The V in applied behavior analysis is what we do, and this can be observable and measurable. And it is going to include action, movement, and performance. So, how we use the term behavior? Behavior in relation to other events or under what conditions? 
things that happen before and things that happen after. Behavior is part of a unit. This includes our ABC, the antecedent behavior and consequence. Okay, the pyramid approach will help you to do whatever it is that you have to do. Now we're gonna ask, I'm, I'm sorry, Can we give me one second? Can you mute me, please? Yes, go ahead. Goody. Goody. Okay, Sandy. Yeah, that's fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And the pyramid approach will help you to do whatever it is that you have uh, to do. So why a pyramid and not a straight line? Because effective teaching demands we attend to a number of factors at the same time. Why, what, and how we're doing things the way we do, and how well those efforts are paying off. So now let's break the pyramid approach down. We are gonna start uh, for the foundation. As you guys can see at the bottom, the why of the behavior. This is basically the science of learning a behavior. Explains much about what, why people do what they do. The second part is the what of teaching. Once we begin to understand why people do what they do, we next need to consider what to teach. The reason why is because we want to change the things they say or do, which means the behavior. Two areas of behavior generally demand the attention of people working and living with learners with special uh, abilities. The first one is the presence of challenging behavior, uh, such as hitting, screaming, biting. And the second one um, is the absence of important key behaviors, uh, such as skill deficits, like functional communication, social skills, uh, and more. So now if we go to the top of the pyramid, the how of teaching. Once we know why people behave the way they do and what to teach, we need to know how we're gonna teach. And before we start with a lesson, we should be clear about where this lesson is gonna take us or where it's gonna lead us. We need to build our methods, strategies to promote general, generalization. And generalization is gonna tell us, where is the lesson going? What kind of lesson are we teaching? Are, um, what type of, type of strategies are we gonna uh, use? Once we understand the full nature of the lesson we want to teach, we need guidelines for designing effective lessons. In other words, see if the lesson matches the individual learner's current needs. We have to remember that all of our learners uh, are not gonna be on the same level. And our goal is to, uh, our goal is to expand uh, the current skills. So let's set an example. We are going to, we're going to teach about Halloween to three different students. The first one knows how to point it to a pumpkin. The second one knows how to say pumpkin. And the third one can describe it as a vegetable. So what we're gonna do with the first one is set a couple of vegetables and we are gonna make the student point to a pumpkin. 
for the second one who knows how to say pumpkin, we're gonna teach him how to say jack o lantern. For the third one, who knows how to describe the vegetable, we can teach uh, the students to describe the process of creating a jack-o'-lantern. Let's, let's move to the data, collecting and analyzing data. If the, learning, if the learner is no learning, something about the lesson needs to be changed. Collecting information will help us to find out whether or not the strategies we're, uh, we're using are working so we can modify or change the lesson plan. So now we go back to, back to the bottom, functional communication, powerful reinforcers, functional activities, uh, contextually inappropriate behavior are part of the foundation and we're gonna be talking uh, about it during the presentation. Okay, to build a pyramid you need a firm base before constructing the building. And uh, as I said before, the construction order, it is important. What does it mean to learn? If any of you guys want to tell me in the chat, what is the meaning uh, of it for you guys? You can tell me and we can read it at, at the end of the presentation. So learning is related with a change in the behavior. And it's like what you can do after a lesson, something that you couldn't do it before. Uh, for example, see the code, write the table, write letters uh, in your name, et cetera. Now to teach, we use strategies that systematically lead to behavior change. Teaching happens before, which is the antecedent, and after, which is the consequence, the behavior occurs. Now we're gonna talk about the functional objective and the functional activities that we need uh, for our lesson plan. Deciding what to teach. The initial step in educational planning is to choose the destination. Once we know it, we can decide how to get from point A to B. So now, what will the situation be like once all our teaching goals have been reached? So now, we teach skills to learners with intention of creating an impact in their lives or uh, uh, and help them to build tools that can be used in the real and natural environment. One of them can be getting a job, living independently, or to become and remain independent as possible. Another one can be uh, to be happy and this involves a set a set of social and communication skills. Choosing the objective. How do we get from here to there? This is gonna uh, be talk about it uh, along the way. Select developmentally appropriate objectives begins with those skills that are missing or significantly delayed related to peers. Mm, this could be based, for example, on a child's age. It can help us uh, as a guide of what is reasonable to expect of a kid. Mm, making reasonable choices depends on, on whether we are well informed. And Mm, as we all know, information is gonna be the key of success for everything. The more we know, uh, the more we can do. Identify areas of strength and weakness. Use a checklist to inventory each learner's performance across the key areas. So now here we can make sure that most of our targets are based on its strengths 
are not completely focused on weaknesses because this could create a, a lot of frustration with the learner. Promote several developmental skills. Teaching learners with special needs is always a context in efficiency, balancing what needs to be accomplished with what time and resources are available. This one serves as a tool for mastering many other uh, objectives in the near future. These functional objectives are going to have a developmental perspective and an individualized programming. If we go to the first one, we're going to compare skills to typical peers. This is similar to what I took uh, at the, uh, in the last slide. We can compare it with, uh, between uh, age groups or something like that, and provides a timeline, timeline on a scope and sequence in a skill developmental. Individualized programming. Surveying current and future settings. So we can, um, we can understand our students at the current time and we can set goals based on the present information. Evaluate the strengths and needs in all areas. And the functional perspective is gonna, uh, is gonna uh, include the individual and the social needs. Now let's go to the functional activities. An special meaningful way to teach learners to build their physical, cognitive, and communica communicative skills while interacting with others is to set instruction within a functional context. What does the learner need to do with the different facets of daily life? This is how we are going to organize our objectives and is related to environmental and base domain skills. We're going to talk about them next. Key functional domains. We're going to, we have here school base, home, community, job skills, work skills, recreation, social and communication. In the school base, we can teach our students to follow in individual and group instructions, taking turns, moving around the classroom and in the school. In home, includes the school's skills to live in a home environment, such as eating, washing dishes, cleaning up, brushing teeth, etc. <coughs> Community. Children initially learn to move around all areas of a school and later to function effectively in parks, playgrounds, transportation. Job skills. To help uh, our students develop and practice job skills to enable them to obtain and retain a job. So let's set an, an example about a mechanic play. Mm, what tools need to be used? In, with what parts and in what order? Work skills. These are gonna be general skills, such as arriving and departing in time, saying good morning, saying thank you, Recreation. Leisure and recreational skills include multiple activities and environments. How we conduct ourselves while watching a movie may differ from the way we watch television. And social and communication is to give them um, tools so they can have the ability to answer a uh, basic question or to ask a basic question, expressing their feelings or emotions. Mm. The, the main reason of this uh, 
functional domain is for the learner with special abilities is because the learner with special abilities is expected to engage uh, as much as possible in the same category of activities as other students. Let's talk about the reinforcement. A powerful reinforcer is going to be the biggest motivation for a learner. And many factors can influence the reinforcer effectiveness. Don't offer anything, everything you have at once. Reinforcer variation is a powerful tool. So what will happen if we provide our students the same reinforcer constantly? It will lead to satisfaction and it's not going to cause an effect anymore or the same one. Choice and control over reinforcer selection can raise the value of the reward selected. Giving individual control over choosing may be an indirect way of influencing their actions. So, uh, let's Let's talk about something like this. We're telling our, our kids, it's bedtime. Do you want a glass of water or juice? What the kids can choose is what to drink, but no whether or no go to bed, because that's not an option. The behavior change can be based uh, in the reinforcement or the punishment. The reinforcement are the consequences that increase the future fre frequency of the behavior and the punishment are the con consequences that decrease the future of the behavior, oh, the future fre frequency of the behavior. Uh, adding an event or removing an event can be positive or negative. And for both cases, it's going to be a, a positive a reinforcement or a neg negative one, the same with the punishment. But we can also remember that what is a positive reinforcement for me may be a negative one for the other person, because all these uh, reinforcements are individual. Okay. Reinforcement pattern. Start by reinforcing each behavior and then we can change the pattern. Setting a long-term goal is going to help us to evaluate, continually evaluate what is happening with the goal. After a while, even if we move on uh, from a uh, X goal, we can come back and reevaluate if our students uh, have really learned. We can determine the pattern in the typical setting. A schedule of reinforcement is basically a rule stating in which instances of behavior will be reinforced. As I said before, the reinforcers are personal. A person's history of learning or conditioning has much to do with the relative effectiveness of a specific reinforcer. Behavior reinforcement pattern is include the number base and the time base, and they both can be variable or fixed. Let's talk about the number base. Um, when it's fixed, there are a set of numbers of responses that most occur before the behavior is rewarded. And the variable, the number of responses need of responses needed for a reward uh, varies, can change. Same by uh, time base, I'm sorry, uh, time base. When we are talking about a variable, the learner or individual gets the reinforced 
the reinforcement based on a varying amount of time. It's unpredictable. So in this case, it's not going to happen all the time, but it can give more opportunities to our students um, to, to keep up with the same behavior because he or she doesn't know when the reinforcement is going to come. And now the fixed interval is when the behavior is regarded after a set amount of time. Preventing and reducing contextually inappropriate behavior. Almost any act you can think of could be inappropriate. If it happened in the wrong place, at the wrong time, persisted too long, or it was too weak for a first ball. It is crucial to find out what events are man maintaining the behaviors so that you can design methods for permitting the person to secure those reinforcers in a more acceptable uh, way. So what, what can I do if the inappropriate behavior persists? We are going to evaluate the base elements of the pyramid. We're going to ask ourselves if the activity is meaningful if the materials are related and interesting, if the strategies we're applying, applying are the correct ones. There are gonna be some conditions that justify an intervention. When the, sorry. It's okay, and it happens to all of us, so don't worry about it, Vanessa. Just take care of whatever's, whatever's going on. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It is perfectly fine. This is great stuff, and, and we're appreciative that you're presenting it, so don't even worry. Keep going. Thank you. Oh, okay, so there are going to be some conditions that justify the intervention when the inappropriate behavior leads to injuries, it can be self or to others, when it leads to significant property damage, when it's socially stigmatizing or interferes with the peer relationship and with in, uh, interferes with learner and self, learning self or other. And now we have the functionally equivalent alternative behavior. The objective of this is to determine what in the environment is functionally related to the unwanted behavior and to teach a preferable alternative way to respond which duplicates that function. A equivalent alternative behavior must be associated with higher rates of reinforcement than the inappropriate behavior. Developing and using a alternative behavior should involve to the learner less effort than the inappropriate behavior. The alternative behavior is determined from the individuals rather than the teacher's perspective. Uh, so this is the first part of our presentation. Thank you. I'm sorry for all the delays I have here. That's okay. That was great, Vanessa. And great words, too, that we learned. I mean, I never heard that expression C-I-B, right? Contextually inappropriate behavior. Yeah. Great, great new word. 
All right. Yeah. So what I'll do is I will um, cancel your spotlight. And um, Catherine, you're next, right? Yes. Okay. So Catherine is going to present on the second part of it. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight your video. So if you want to share your screen and go ahead and get started with the second part. Thank you. Okay, well, Vanessa co uh, covered a lot of uh, important things that we learned. I'm going to concentrate on functional teaching strategies. Uh, I've been with the center for, this is my 12th year, and uh, I've been with Janine's class and the Jade class for, oh gosh, we're losing track, six years now, Janine. <laughs> but um, she is an excellent teacher and has taught me so much. But, um, and we do use a lot of these in our classroom. But do we always have to teach sitting at the table and sitting in chairs? Um, can you guys see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. But I can't change my screen for some reason. To do what? I want to go to the next slide. Um, now are you, so if, can you use your arrow keys? Well, I don't see. Um, what about just on your keyboard, Catherine? Do, can you okay. just hit the arrow key to the right? Nothing's happening. Okay, so if you are you using a mouse or do you use a key a pad? I have both. So if you tap, oh, here it goes. Here, oh. here it goes. I got it. I okay, got great, it. great. Thank you. I just used the a uh, different arrow. Okay. Well, no, you don't have to be sitting at a chair and at a table because anywhere a learner loves to be is where the teacher can teach. And Andy Bondi stressed this a lot. Um, you always teach at the interest of the learner. You want to keep things interesting for them, and that helps you pair with them. And then any academic social skill, lesson plan, PT lesson, OT lesson, speech lesson, anything can be done in a variety of settings with a variety of things, and you're also generalizing at the same time. So it's, it's more, more bang for your buck. Um, as you see, we can teach outside, we can teach in garden, all four seasons we can teach the kids out, outdoors, in the hallways, we teach them at the community table, the conversation table is what Sandy calls it, um, on our walks, ev on the playground, everything we do, we're teaching the children. Andy Bondi stressed the importance of having functional objectives for the learner. Um, the daily living skills, hygiene, cooking, food preparation, everything that they need to know to have a successful life should be high on the list of communication requests and objectives. Now, imitation skills are fundamental, and that's where we begin, but to get a child to communicate with us, to imitate us, they have to, they have to be looking at us, first of all, and a lot of our learners don't have uh, eye contact at first. That can be taught using shaping, and I'll go over that later. But also we need to pair with our learners because that's the only way they're going to really be engaging with us. So pairing before you do the imitation skills are the fundamental, right when they come in the door, when they're two years and eight months old, when we get them, is what we should start doing. And there should always be at least four lessons in act any activity that you are doing. Um, you can find, if you really look at it, you can find a lot of lessons in any activity. Um, academics should always impact on other functional skills, like the little girl helping her father fold clothes, and uh, he can teach her a lot of different things doing that, and the mother teaching the daughter to be on the phone and how to hold the phone and communication and it's, it's all very functional. 
Now, how many different types of lessons are in this activity? You can use the chat box if you can find, I've written down seven. If you can find at least four or five and put them in the chat box, that would be great. And I'll just wait a couple of minutes while people write that in. Now, Sandy, I can't see the chat box. My whole screen is my. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Okay. So now it's say. Oh yeah. So here's some great things. Somebody said color identifying. Somebody yes. else said prepositions. Yep. <laughs> right. I was going to write something related to motor skills. Someone wrote yes. safety. Yes. Climbing, turn taking. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of lessons in, and those are all of them. Uh, color social interaction. Yeah. Social interaction. Yes. Communication, listening to each other. They can even count how many colored hand holders there are. There's just so many lessons in that one activity. It's just about being creative. Well, thank you everybody for, for uh, participating. Can I go on or do you still wanna? Yeah, chat? no, there, um, somebody else just wrote gross motor requesting prepositions, actions, turn taking, imitating <laughs> language, counting, someone else wrote turn taking, color recognition. Yes, 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 yeah, and yes. Yep, there's a lot of lessons there. There really are. Thank you. Reinforcement. We know about that. Reinforcement, reinforcement. We've been off and if it wasn't for COVID pay, we wouldn't be getting reinforced, right? <laughs> we want to reinforce the kids. Even, I'll tell you why. <laughs> you know what, you have to know what your motivates your students, first of all. So that's why we get those lists in the beginning of the year from the parents and we make lists and we test out the objects in our areas to see what they like. You make sure the entire team knows, don't keep it a secret. Make sure everybody on your team knows what's going on, what the children like. Do they like high fives? Do they like to bounce? Do they like goldfish? Do they like, um, you know, any toy that you might like, like wind up toys, whatever you have, you can share with the team. And then always seek to expand the repertoire of reinforcers. Uh, if, if a child has a limited amount of reinforcers, we use those reinforcers to expand on more reinforcers. And um, I know Sandy showed us some good videos about that. I don't have any information about that, but you can, you can use what they already like to get them to like something new by putting what they already like, say, on a I know you did this with Bristol. You put her favorite blocks on top of a slide so that she would learn to be like the slide also because she didn't like the slide and she came to like the slide. And then of course you always have to catch them being good. We forget sometimes to, while the child is, is behaving and all the other kids are screaming, we have to reinforce that child that's behaving. We have to catch them being good or if they're all sitting nice for circle and you're like totally amazed, nobody's crying. Reinforce that group. Everybody's sitting so nice, here's a sticker. And you have to do that a lot. And the younger the learner, the more frequent the reinforcement. Andy Bondi stressed that three and four year olds need reinforcement every minute to stay on task. Uh, he also said that teenagers needed about once every hour of adult work that they're doing. They need to be in reinforced each hour. And then of course the younger ones, half hour, 20 minutes. So you go by the age. And you wanna generalize from the start. And we've been talking about generalization. Beth Estes on our Wednesday videos have been uh, talking about that last week. Whenever you teach a student on the autism spectrum, you must teach the skill across people, across settings, different examples, different teachers, and different uses of words. 
Now you see I have just an example. There's three different pictures of a dog that, and even a, a dog in real life, you would want to teach them all of that. That's totally different than discrimination. Discrimination is discriminating between a dog and a cat, but this is generalization. And you want to teach whatever you're teaching the child in different settings also. Um, outside, inside, playground, home. You always want to make sure that the parents know what you're teaching so that they can teach the same thing at home to generalize. Changing what we do is learning and doing the same thing over and over is stagnation and ritualistic. Andy Bondi stressed that a lot. He's, he's a very creative man and he's very fun to listen to and he keeps things going. And I think that's the key for a lot of these learners. They need to be engaged by creativity and fun. And that's the way to get to them a lot of times. Um, doing the same thing over and over again for most of these kids gets pretty boring and then they start having behaviors. Um, so we have to change up how we do things. I know I used to teach math when we had areas in years and years ago and I had to change up how I taught math. <laughs> Wasn't generalizing, that's for sure. But I had to change up how I taught it or else the kids would get really bored. I had to change up, you know, how I counted things. I had to print up pictures of their favorite characters so that the numbers would be on those cards instead of just the regular number one card. It was, it was a lot of changing because otherwise the kids would have had severe behaviors. Discrete trial teaching is what we do as the ABA therapy. Andy Bondi prefers one trial for one target, which is what we've been doing in the school for the last five or six years. Uh, if the learner gets it, you reinforce. And if the learner does not get it, we correct him immediately, repeat the trial, prompt him with the correct answer. Then we do a gross motor activity that the learner knows. You ask the original target for the third time, and either it's a plus or a prompt. And that's 